We're in chapter 16. We're going to look at the subject of you're going to give a lot of money tonight or never leave. And that's fine. <laughs> no. Just kidding. First Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, Christian giving. Paul writes, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Now, Paul is about to close his letter. And he's moving from what we've been looking at, which is doctrinal or from the teaching, pure teaching, to what we would call the practical. Paul is dealing here in this passage with what is referred to here as a collection for the saints. Now, this particular collection that he's speaking about are for the poor saints who are in the city of Jerusalem. And so when he speaks of the collection, that word collection speaks of the gathering together of finances. It's not speaking simply, though, of the offering that's being received for those who have need in Jerusalem, but this is a general offering that he's speaking about, and much of it will be obviously given to those in great need, and we'll see that in just a moment. We need to know that um, the believers in Jerusalem who are going to receive this offering, a good portion of the offering, well, these believers in Jerusalem had become poor. They had become poor because there had been two things combining to produce poverty. One was that there had been a famine. And two is that they began to suffer through persecution. Now, this famine is spoken of in the book of Acts in chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. In Acts 11, 28 through 30, it says, One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. So there is a famine, and so there's a financial need. And secondly, there's great persecution. A great persecution had arisen against the believers also in Jerusalem. After the martyrdom of Stephen, the church in Jerusalem had become a target for hatred. It says in chapter 8 of Acts, verse 1, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Now, at one time, the church at Jerusalem was able to care for its own members. That was especially true when you begin to look at the history of the church. Because when you look into the book of Acts, for example, again, chapter 2, in verses 44 and 45, it says all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And so the habit of the early church was to make sure that the members of the body of Christ were cared for. Later on in chapter 4 of Acts, verses 34 and 35, it says, Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And so there was a love, a genuine love that existed in the body of Christ after Pentecost. When the church had been birthed and people had need, if I had something, a possession that I could sell as a member of the church, seeing that one of my brothers or sisters was in need, then I would be one who would sell something in order to give. And so there was this love that the body of Christ had for one another that was very practical. It's kind of like what James says. He says, if any of you see a brother who is destitute, lacking, and uh, you say to them, go, be warmed and filled, he said, what kind of faith is that? When you see a real practical need and you don't even do anything to meet it, he said, that kind of faith is dead because it lacks works. So in the early church, there was a sense of generosity. Of a, a, of if there was a need, that somebody in the body of Christ would meet that need. And so that was very common. They knew that love wasn't just something they sang about or talked about. They knew that love was something that you did. It was something that you practiced. It was a way of life. 
Now, in the Old Testament, there are so many scriptures that relate to that. For example, Proverbs 3.27, where it says, Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hands to do so. There is, uh, in the New Testament, Titus chapter 3, verse 14, which says, Let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. And so the Bible, from old to the new, speaks about being practical in our love and ministering that which we have. And if somebody has material need, and I have it in the power of my hand to meet that material need, and obviously it's a need that's a genuine need. It's not just a, a felt need. It's a real need. I mean... I heard about a kid who, this is a true story, by the way. I heard about a kid who wanted a Ferrari. And that was his felt need. And he wanted it. And he wanted it so bad, he actually advertised. I want a Ferrari, and it has to be red. And somebody read his ad and said, man, that kid's got a lot of nerve. I'll give him a Ferrari. <laughs> and he calls him up, gets in contact with him, and he says, um, you, you have the nerve to ask. I'll give you my Ferrari. And the kid says, what color is it? The guy says, it's silver. And the kid says, I want a red Ferrari. I don't want the silver one. True story. And so me, I'll take any Ferrari. <laughs> I'm not choosy. But when there's a real need, not just a felt need, when there's a real need, the body of Christ has always rallied to that. I can tell you this. I can tell you that when I was not saved, when I was beginning to encounter Christians, my friends who had become Christians, one of the things that had the biggest impact on me was their generosity. I can tell you that. Because my background, I was not generous. And so when someone was generous towards me or somebody else in front of me, I looked at them and I thought, what an unusual person. Because they were generous. See, because I wasn't, I was very, very, very cheap. And so, I mean, to this day, my friend Bill, whom I meet with once a month, and I've known since we were in kindergarten, uh, my friend Bill on occasion will still tease me because I took him and bought him a hamburger when we were 13 years old, and the hamburger cost like 22 cents. And he still reminds me, and the hamburger was called an A-burger. I don't know why it was called an A-burger, but it was. It was an A-burger. And he still, when we go out for lunch, he'll say, well, are you going to get me an A-burger today? You know, he still remembers that because I was very cheap. I mean, I didn't work. I used to go in the back of, uh, of gas stations when my tires needed to be replaced, and I would climb in the bin where they discarded used tires, and I would look for my tire size. Then I would find one that still had a little tread. And I would go to a friend of mine's uh, gas station. He worked for his father. And he would mount that on my, uh, for me. So I never bought tires. I, I just didn't do things like that. I mean, if you can find something that's still usable, use it. So when, when I was with my friends and they were generous, they actually were buying meals for us and making them and serving us. I have to tell you, now you, I don't think anybody in here is as cheap as I was. But I will tell you this, that impacted me. It really did. I thought, man, these are the kind of people to hang around with. You get free stuff all the time. This is good. I didn't know that it was love that they were showing, but I discovered that later on. Christians have always been generous. They've always been generous. There are studies done. I have a book in my office somewhere that speaks concerning the generosity of the American. Americans are known for being very generous people, and indeed, as a nation, we are. But when you begin to look at the most generous within that nation, the most generous, they'll say the way they say it is, the most generous are the religious individuals who are known for the generosity because not only do they pay their taxes, but they give charitable gifts on top of that where a lot of people believe that they don't have to help the poor or the infirm or anything like that because they're already paying their taxes and thus out of my tax dollar, there's support to them through the welfare, etc. Christians not only pay our taxes, but we also charitably give to those in need. And that is something that's been well-founded and demonstrated because it's religious faith that provokes us to give like that. So the mark of the believer has always been generosity from the very beginning. 
and we just simply need to be encouraged and taught to continue to be of that nature. Now, after the persecution had arisen, uh, the believers there in Jerusalem had begun to suffer. Some became very poor. So in response, Paul is appealing to the body of Christ to meet the need of their Christian family. And once again, we're called to be generous to all. But like he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so there's a collection that's being received here in 1 Corinthians 16. This collection basically has two purposes. One is it's going to relieve the physical needs of the poor believers in Jerusalem. Again, as mentioned, James writes concerning the generosity of, of a believer and speaks, and I, I mentioned this, but let me read it, James 2, 15 and 16. He said, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And so one, it was to relieve the physical needs of the poor believers, but secondly, it was revealing the spiritual unity of the body of Christ. Again, as I had mentioned a moment ago in Galatians 6, 10, you are to take care of those who are of the household of faith. And so Paul is writing concerning the collection for the saints. And he says in verse 1, As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. So Paul had ordered, and I want you to see that. It wasn't a suggestion that he made, and I want you to see his apostolic authority here. He wasn't making a suggestion, it would be great if you... No, he gave an order to the churches that were there in the region of Galatia, and he had said, you need to contribute to the needs of these believers. And so he's issuing what we would today call a reasonable command. And he had the authority to do that. And so he is saying to them, I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, but I'm also saying this to you too. This is a reasonable command coming from apostolic authority that you should be concerned about your brethren who are suffering. And now he tells them this is what you're to do, verse 2. He says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So Paul lays down principles for giving offerings to the Lord. Uh, one of the keys to giving an offering to the Lord or giving your gifts, one of the keys is that financial gifts are given to God first, and then they are distributed as needs arise. And when the Lord commands us to be generous, and when you see commands in Scripture that speak concerning financial generosity and giving, we need to remember that, that uh, giving is not God's way of raising money. Giving is God's way of raising His children. He's teaching us to be generous. Uh, if I have any parents in this room, um, think with me for just a moment. How generous was your three-year-old? Mine were not very generous. Um, mine had more of a propensity of wanting rather than giving at the ages of two and three and 30. I mean, they, had a, <laughs> they have a, a tendency to want to get rather than give. Isn't that true? It's pretty true in most cases, maybe not always, but in general. I, I, they had this desire to get. I can still remember my son David when he was two years old. He had those pajamas, those kinds of pajamas that had the little feet, you know, and, and he, we had gone to some friend's house, and our friend had a, a little boy his age. Dave was two or three years old at the time, and, and uh, I brought David home, and I carried him and placed him in his bed. But as I was doing that, I noticed that one of his pajama feet was longer than the other. It was just kind of longer, and I thought, my, my goodness, what is this? And so I grabbed his little foot, and I felt something. In, in this little, in, you know, the little, I don't know what they're called, just the little feet of the, of the pajama. So I took down the pajamas and I turned it and I shook it and a matchbox car came out, a little matchbox car. I knew David liked matchbox toys and things like that, but I thought, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. David stole from his friend, his little friend's name was Adam, and he stole Adam's matchbox car. And I got all scared. I said, oh, 
Oh, no, I'm raising a bank robber. This guy's going to steal for sure. He's a thief. He's a thief. Oh, my God. What am I going to do? So the next day I call up um, Adam's, Adam's um, mama, Debbie, and uh, her husband was my first assistant. And so we're very close, and I, I call her. I said, Debbie, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. My David stole one of Adam's matchbox cars last night. We have it here at the house. She says, oh, don't worry about it. Adam's got so many of David's over here, it doesn't really matter. They, they'd, been, they'd been stealing from each other for, I guess, some time, right? Children are not known for being generous. They really aren't. You have to teach them to be generous normally. And, and if you teach them well, if you teach them at the beginning, they remain generous the rest of their life as a habit because you've, you've, you've helped them to learn to do that. And so early in my children's life, when they were very little, I began to teach them to give to the Lord. I began when they were, uh, before they were five years old. And what we would do is we would get these baby jars, and, you know, after the kids had eaten, we'd wash them out, and the baby food jars, we kept them, and each one of them had a little baby food jar of their own. As they grew older, each one of them, we finally had the four baby food jars, and I would give my kids a, an allowance. And how I did it with them is I would give them a dollar. They didn't know the value of a dollar yet. And so I would give them a dollar, but it was never in paper money because they never really would be able to understand the significance of that dollar bill, right? And so I gave them dimes. I gave them 10 dimes. And I would put a stack of dimes on a week, every week, 10 dimes in front of this little jar. And I was teaching them basic principles of giving. And so what I would do is I would put the 10 dimes there, and I would say, these 10 dimes are your allowance. You can do basically what you want with this. This is your money. But we always give to Jesus something first. And so I'd say, I actually had two jars, and I'd take one of the dimes to give them a principle, and I would drop the dime in a jar, then I'd take the nine dimes, and I would drop the nine in the other jar. And I said, these nine dimes are yours. This one dime is Jesus. Inevitably, they would say, you didn't give him enough. Inevitably. Because I have nine, and he only has one. And so I said, do you want to give him more? And they would always say, yes, I'd like to give him more. So I was teaching them generosity at an early age that you can never outgive God. I was trying to teach them that. Now, eventually, they got to the point of knowing what nine dimes will buy. And they said, you know, Jesus is doing cool with just one dime, you know, but, <laughs> but at the beginning, <laughs> they would give three or four dimes. They always did, because it was a visual. And I was teaching them this, and this is something even we adults can learn. I can live just as well on nine dimes as I can on one or rather 10. I can live just as well on nine as I can on 10. Because it, the whole key is understanding budgeting. It's understanding giving. It's understanding value, what real value is. I wanted to teach my children generosity, and I taught them that with a visual. And so that's something that is just part of the church always has been. So giving is not God's way of raising money. God owns everything anyway. It's his way of raising his children. Now, when am I to give to the Lord? Well, I want you to notice uh, when he says in verse 2 on the first day of the week, uh, he's speaking concerning the fact that the church would gather together as a regular practice on the first day of the week. The reason it did so is the obvious reason that Jesus was raised from the dead on Sunday. And so they would gather very early in the history of the church from the beginning, really, they would gather on the first day. And so, because it was a day of celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they would gather and they would have this particular opportunity to give their offerings. Now, it's not simply that you only give, obviously, on a Sunday. You give whenever the Lord leads you to, but it speaks concerning the fact that you give in an appropriate way regularly. Sunday, obviously, is, a, is a, an obvious time to do that. But giving is to be a part of regular worship because it is systematic. 
when he says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing, uh, um, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come, it's simply pointing out that giving is part of our regular worship to God and therefore is systematic. It's part of our worship. So a lot of people don't realize that. But your giving, when you take out whatever it is and you, you, know, you put it in that bucket or you put it in that agape box or whatever manner of giving you have today is a lot of le electronic giving and all because, you know, my kids don't carry, um, they don't carry cash. My kids don't. They carry a debit card and they use that. And I think that's pretty normal for a lot of people today. And uh, you usually know the age of somebody by the fact that they carry a checkbook or whatever because we still use checks. Well, I actually don't use checks. My wife uses them. <laughs> she uses a lot of them. But my, my <laughs> and so, but there, are, there is a way to give, and it, it's to be systematically. It's to be regularly. Why? Because it is a regular act of worship. I believe very strongly that giving to God is one of the most tangible expressions of faith that a believer actually practices. Giving is an act of faith, and it's done regularly, not just when we have extra money or when we feel generous. It is one of the most practical, physical, real acts of worship that we have. And it's the one thing that we can look and see Jesus actually commend us about very clearly. In Mark chapter 12, Verses 41 through 44, Jesus is commenting on something that he observes. It says in Mark 12, 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came in and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Now, a lot of times people will use that and they will say, see, you know, it's not the amount, it's the heart. We're missing the point that Jesus is making here. There was an absolute amount of faith that was being commended here. Not the small amount that she gave, but the immense amount of trust that she was showing because she gave all that she had, even her living. She gave it all to the Lord in trust. And so we have to be careful not to, to misunderstand that because sometimes people say, well, man, it doesn't really matter. And I'll just drop in, and, and it's between you and the Lord, of course, and, and who's to say that it's not? But we're missing the point. We're missing the point in that Jesus is commending her generosity and faith in that. He's not even making mention, really, of the amount of money per se. He's just contrasting it between those who are very rich, who had a lot that they could give and never even feel it, versus this woman who gave her livelihood. And he's commending the faith that is behind that, so you actually see some very basic spiritual lessons in that passage. One, there's a rebuke to the greedy who live well but give little to the Lord. In, in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Jesus said it like this. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. So he's saying there are those who could give more who didn't. They were living well, but in proportion to what they had, they gave very little to the Lord. So it's really a rebuke. But secondly, it's a lesson to the less well-off who fail to trust the Lord and therefore give him nothing at all. I have heard people say, and I have, I have dealt with this myself in my own life so I can share it. I have heard people say, I can't afford to give to the Lord. I learned a long time ago, I can't afford not to. Because the Bible very clearly speaks about our God being the provider of all things. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's one of those scriptures that we don't want to see whether or not that's true. We just don't do that. So what we do is if we have extra money, we might give him something. If we don't have extra money, we won't. 
may I be honest with you as I share this because I don't want to come off critical to you. You all came because you want to hear a study, and therefore I don't want to sound like I'm bashing anybody because I'm not. It's just an observation I've made. And I was sharing with somebody about this just the other day in conversation, so I'll just repeat it out loud to you. And they were sharing with me how that this person doesn't give to the Lord. They don't go to this church, so I can use this openly and say this. They don't go to this fellowship. They go to Rawls. But um, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Definitely just kidding. But as we were speaking, he said, well, they cannot give to the Lord because they can't afford it. I said, really? Yeah. They can't afford it? No. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Do they, do they go and buy coffee anywhere during the week? Oh, yeah, all the time. So they go to, we'll say, you know, whatever coffee shop you want to name. You know, oh, by the way, I know a place where you can get 10-cent coffee still. But anyway, that's just something. That's an aside. <laughs> Take one of those dimes from the baby jar and go get yourself some coffee, man. It's in L.A. But anyway, um, <laughs> but you go out and buy a cup of coffee, 2 $3, whatever you, whatever you spend on it, whatever you spend. Let's just give it the number five, just for a number, $5. Do they buy more than one cup a week? Yeah. Do I have anybody in here who drinks coffee? I'm curious. I don't know. Yeah, I drink coffee. I just was wondering. It's the Christian drug. I was just wondering if you were... <laughs> If you're addicted to. Um, <laughs> so we drink coffee. A lot of us do. Or teas or whatever. We, 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 we buy these things, right? So I asked, do they drink coffee? Yes. Do they drink more than one cup a week? Oh, yeah. So if you buy three cups of coffee, we'll say three cups. We'll say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three cups of coffee. Am I downing doing that? No, of course. I'm not. I'm just making an observation. You buy one on Monday. One on Wednesday and one on Friday, that's 15 bucks, right? Do you leave a tip? Probably not, but say you do. So let's add another dollar to all of that or whatever change. And, and what you're looking at is anywhere from 15 to $18 a week on a cup of coffee three times a week. All you need to do is begin to ask yourself, do I give to the Lord as much as I give to the local coffee place? And that's what I was saying to him. They can afford to buy coffee but they can't afford to give to Jesus. Can you imagine that in the average church, if the people in the church began to give just the amount of money that they spend on coffee a week, could you imagine all the evangelism that could take place? All the staff that could be added? When you have a church of 5,000, 6,000 people and 13% um, support the entire church. Could you imagine what would happen if those who never gave anything began to give just what they spent on coffee a week? Could you imagine how much good you could do in the kingdom of God? You see, it's a matter of learning to budget and to prioritize. When Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, he wasn't kidding. Because that's what establishes your entire life priority. But there are those who say, but I can't afford to give to the Lord who, and I'm not knocking them, and I want to be careful not to be misunderstood. I'm not knocking them. God is doing fine without me having, you know, to prop him up financially. God's doing fine. It's not like he's begging, and I certainly am not. I'm just trying to make some points here as we're talking about giving. Bottom line is you can go into a closet and you can find clothing that was expensive when bought has only been worn once or twice because it's hidden behind so many other things that are cluttering that closet. It's just the way Americans are with our finances. And when somebody speaks concerning generosity, they say, that's why I don't go to church. You're always asking for money. What that really is, is it's called conviction. It's, it's the Lord speaking to the heart saying, but if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, and you say you worship me, then how are you demonstrating that? How do you go about demonstrating that? One of the most tangible ways is through your giving. 
and trusting God to supply all your need. There's a quote that I'd like to give to you. If both the rich and the poor seriously consider this, one will learn compassion and the other will learn generosity and both will be blessed by the Lord. Now, as he is saying here, let each, let each one of you lay something aside. That means all believers are givers. That each Christian gives an offering to the Lord. The whole work of God is supported by the whole body of Christ. One person ought not to be giving while the other person doesn't. All should consider in their heart what they can and they should give as the Lord leads. And that way all are working together. It says in Ephesians 4 verse 16, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So the whole body of Christ is actually contributing to the work of God when you give your offerings to the Lord. Now, Somebody says, well, where am I supposed to give my offerings? You know, if I'm watching the TV evangelist and, and he says that they're in need right now and, and all should I send to them? I have those questions every once in a while. I remember one evangelist who was saying to those who were, he was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, speaking to, he said to them, if you send uh, uh, any donation to this church, uh, to, this, to this ministry, he says, I will send you a blessed wallet that will never be empty. I'll never forget that. I will send you a blessed wallet that will always have money in it. So I'm thinking to myself, why don't you just get one of your own wallets? I mean, that makes sense to me. That way you won't be asking me for anything because it'll never be empty. But so what we have seen so many charlatans, haven't we? We've seen people selling things, you know, send some money to this, to this ministry and Al will send you a watermelon seed. And you plant the watermelon seed, and it grows a watermelon. And even as the watermelon has many seeds, even so God is going to give to you money because you have planted your seed of faith in my ministry. I've heard so many come-ons in that way that it makes Christians jaded. We begin to wonder, can I even trust them? If I send money to them, what are they doing with that? Yet we bring that into the body of Christ. We bring that to the local church that we fellowship in and we carry that mentality and we project it on the church that we attend. When I would say this, if a person doesn't trust me as their pastor or the pastor of their church, they probably shouldn't be there. They probably should go to a church where they trust the pastor. But if they don't trust the ministers of the church to actually distribute what God gives in a proper way, they ought to go to a church that they do trust those people in. I don't have a problem with that. If somebody doesn't trust me, you know what? It takes a long time to earn trust. But at the same time, I have seen a habit of some who just will say, well, I've seen this in the past and I don't trust. No, the, the bottom line is, is you're really not willing to give because you're really not willing to worship. And if you don't really trust, then you have to deal with your issues of trust. But you can't blame every minister because of somebody you saw on TV who is sending prayer mats that you place your wallet in the center of and then take the largest bill out and put it there and then give it to this ministry. You can't be blaming every ministry like that because they're not all charlatans. Back in 1990, when I was five years old, um, <laughs> we were, um, Rhea and I went to a dealership to purchase a van for our children, our growing family, and the car salesman had me test drive this uh, van. And uh, as we were driving, he was seated shotgun, passenger side next to me, and he says to me, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, here we go. I said to him, and what he's wanting to find out is if I have a job and I can afford to buy a car. I understand that. So I say, I'm a pastor. And he gets quiet, because they usually do. They don't know what to do with this, right? A lot of times they'll say, oh, I grew up in the church. Or, oh, I went to Sunday school all my life. Or, you know, they'll, they'll do that. They're trying to relate to me, which I find it a lot of fun. <laughs> this time, though, he was more straight up. He said, oh, you're a pastor. I said, yes. Pastors are thieves. 
I said, oh, really? Yeah, I'm going to take from the poor box so I can buy this van. No, he says, pastors are thieves. I said, really? He goes, yeah. I mean, he was certain. And I said, let me, let me, you mind if I tell you something? He says, no, go ahead. I said, you know, the last two cars I bought were sold to me by lying car salesmen. <laughs> I said, they lied to me. They ripped me off. Two of them in a row, lying car salesmen. And I go, but you're not a lying car salesman, are you? You're an honest car salesman, aren't you? And you're going to give me a good deal, aren't you? And he goes, that's right, sir. I'm an honest car salesman. And I remember shaking his hand and saying, and I'm an honest pastor. And I said to him, do you know that there are over 500,000 pastors in the United States? Did you know that? He says, no, I didn't know that. I said, and I can tell you that the overwhelming majority of them are God-fearing people who love the Lord and are honest. There are some who are not. That's true. But the overwhelming majority are honest. And I said, so I'm an honest pastor. It's nice to meet you. But there are people out there who actually are afraid because they don't trust the people who are holding the finances. So you have to ask yourself whether or not you trust those who are going to care for it. We'll see that in just a second. But where do you regularly give? Well, he said storing up. The, the term storing up is actually speaking of a treasury. It, it would be referring normally to the temple. And what he's speaking about is your gifts will go to your, your fellowship. In Acts chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, once again, neither was there any among them that lacked, as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them and brought the prices of the things and laid them down at the apostles' feet. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. He goes on to say, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. Trust me. By the way, that's the one place you, in Scripture you find God actually inviting you to test him. That's the one place in Scripture that you find God actually inviting you, test me. See whether or not I will supply. See whether or not I'm good to my word. Bring your gifts and watch what I'll do. So what we do is we budget for the work of the Lord. That requires responsibility. That requires prioritizing. Now, if I were to ask the question, who is the greatest TV evangelist? There are those who would respond, the greatest TV evangelist? They would respond with the name of a Christian leader. For many years until his basic retirement, the most famous we know of is who? Billy Graham. So we say, who is the greatest TV evangelist? And the church answers, Billy Graham. You might find it interesting. That's not true. The greatest TV evangelists are corporations. CBS, NBC, ABC are the greatest TV evangelists in the world. Why? Because they are constantly, 24 hours a day, evangelizing you into their way of thinking. They do it 24-7 365. They do it constantly. The greatest evangelists in our nation and the world are the corporate executives who purchase advertising and produce shows. In the 50s, the family in TV made up of a dad, a mom, children. Father knows best. Leave it to Beaver. Things like that. You start moving over time, eventually you get into different families. You end up with, with um, Roseanne and her family, right? 
You look at Archie Bunker and his family. Then you get into our, into our time and you have the new normal or the modern family. And when you look at how things have changed from, you know, Lucy, I love Lucy, where they had a child, little Ricky, but they, they slept in two separate beds. And you wonder how that happened. They don't even, they're never even together because they didn't even show things like that because it was improper. And so what have we seen? We have seen advertising. Where do people get the ideas that the family structure, the way it's being presented today, is the new normal? Where did they get that idea from? 24-7, you are being told that by programmers, by executives. So the greatest evangelists are not the Christian evangelists. It's the world. And the world is constantly evangelizing. They have the physical resources to do that. And we, the church, help to supply it by buying the products that they advertise. So we need to be good stewards. We need to use our finances wisely to further the kingdom of God. And contrary to what the world believes, money is not our God. Financial faithfulness is basic to the Christian life because we have an eternal perspective. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world. We can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. That's what we're called to, contentedness, contentment. And all of us in this room are old enough to know that you can't buy the things that are most important when it comes to emotional or spiritual. You can't. You can't buy things like peace. You can't buy things like joy. You can't buy things like love. You can't buy contentment. You can't buy those things. Those are things that you cannot shop for and buy. Those are things that come in different ways, right? And so we, the church, need to understand that. We need to understand what our priorities really ought to be. And so God has called me to have a generous spirit. Yeah. You see, when, when we learn to give to the Lord, it actually goes against our old nature because our old sinful nature is more inclined towards getting than giving. It's been said, by giving, I become more like the God who gave and still gives. And sometimes it incurs sacrifice. The Macedonian churches were impoverished, and yet they gave. Paul is going to res respond to that or say something about that in 2 Corinthians 8.3 when he says, I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. So we are stewards of all that God gives us, no matter how much or how little we do have. And giving of support is part of our stewardship responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, it says, It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, he says again in verse 2, you say, storing up, he says, storing up as he may prosper. And so, the word prosper literally means to be led along a good road. Somebody has asked, and therefore I'll give this answer, um, is there a percentage that they should give? Interestingly enough, in the New Testament, there is a no percentage that's given there. The Old Testament has the tithe. Jesus made reference to the practice of the tithe, the tithe being 10% normally. But when you begin to look at tithes in the Old Testament, you start seeing that the tithe was actually over 30% because there were various tithes that they gave. And then, or, then there was a tithe that they would they would give every three years. And so you were looking at 33%. And so starting at 10% was a good place. But in the New Testament, there's no percentage. Giving is assumed to be part of the life of a believer and is always a response of a grateful heart. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, uh, remember this, and you already heard this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Reluctantly or under compulsion. 
when the bucket comes, if somebody's feeling all sweaty about giving, they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. Just because we're focusing the camera on each one of you individually, <laughs> we call it tithe vision and you can, you can see your face and you're going... <laughs> That'll increase the offering, I guarantee you. <laughs> I was in a meeting one time. There were only four or five of us that were seated uh, in a circle. And there was a missionary who was giving his um, needs, and he was giving us an update on his mission. And, and I had $5 in my wallet. That's what I had. I still remember very well because... The pastor who hosted this missionary said, I believe that we need to give an offering to help this man in his, min in his mission. And he says, we're not going to close our eyes. Let's just keep our eyes open and, and give to this man. I only had $5 in my wallet. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, that's my lunch, man. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you. And I'm saying, I don't even know this guy. I just met him. He's asking me to give my lunch money to somebody I've never met in my life. And I was... And it's only five bucks, but, but it was my five bucks. And I, I wasn't happy with it. And I still remember that compulsion and opening up my wallet and dropping my $5 in. And I'm telling you this because I have no reward. God's got not given me a reward for that. That was grumpy giving. That, 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 was, not, that was not of the Lord. And, and I felt the compulsion. I know what Paul's talking about when he says not out of compulsion. Not out of compulsion. You give because God gave to you, not because somebody makes you feel guilty for not. You give because it's an act of worship. Look at God has done for me. How can I do anything but give to him? How can I? And that's how it works, you see. It's really always out of love. And now he says that there be no collections when I come. He just wants to make sure that this gift is, is prepared in advance. Verse 3 when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So whomever you approve by your letters, when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift. This letter that he's referring to is what we would today call a letter of recommendation. Paul was avoiding involving himself in the collecting of money and taking it to Jerusalem. So he instructed them to select trusted men, which kept him blameless. Um, you're not asking, but I'll volunteer this to you. I don't know who gives in this church. I never have, and I don't want to. I don't know who gives in this church. When our church first began, we did not receive an offering. For the first 20-plus years, we never received an offering. The very first Sunday morning we had, I gave the Bible study, July 26, 1981, and I said, if you guys want to come back next week, I'll be here. We were in a house in Ontario. I'll be here. If you want to come back, I'll be here. And I didn't know if anybody would come back. And so my father said, David, can I ask you a question? My dad was at the Bible study. And I said, Yes, what, what, what do you want to ask, Dad? He said, we know that you love us and you love teaching the word, but you've got a family. You didn't receive an offering. How can we help you? And I said to my dad, you never went to my baseball games. No, I, I said, <laughs> I said to my dad, Daddy, we are not incorporated. Any gifts that come in are not tax-deductible contributions. We're just having a Bible study on a Sunday. I said, I, I don't want to receive an offering. He says, but what if we want to give? I said, if you want to give, if anybody here wants to give. I said, you see that pot hanging by that macrame there in the corner by the fireplace? Put something in there. But what if we want to help you? My dad was one of these persistent guys. What if we want to help you? If you want to help me care for my family, they're starving, they're so hungry, they need shoes. No, if, <laughs> and I've got a packet of watermelon seeds, but... <laughs> 
I said, if you want to help our family, Dad, and anybody wants to, just mark your gift for the family. And anything that comes in for our family, I'll use for our family. Anything else that comes in, we'll use to incorporate this church so that your gifts are regarded by the state as being tax deductible. So we didn't receive offerings. We didn't receive offerings for the first 20 plus years. And God took care of us every step of the way. So people who can come in even tonight, perhaps it's their first time here, you think that's the way these churches are. They're always asking for money. That's because you don't know the history of this church. We never have. We never did. When we moved into this property here from Ontario, I was not told this, but we were short, and we didn't receive offerings. We were short $180,000. We needed to come up with $180,000 in something like three, three weeks. I didn't know that. For some reason, that wasn't brought to my attention. You'd think it would have been, but it wasn't. I never came up with any concerns. I never came up and said, oh, by the way, I didn't even know that. All I know is God gave us this property. Without receiving offerings, we received $180,000 extra in three weeks that we never even asked for. My God shall supply all your need, is what the Bible says. I've learned to trust him. I've known that. And I've learned over time. You can never outgive God. You just can't. If God gave his son, what is he going to withhold from us? Seeing that he gave his son, what has greater value? And so it's, it's the Lord teaching us how to, to, to be just trusting in him. Paul did not want to be blamed. He wanted a blameless thing. Again, I don't know who gives in this church. I've, I've had people walk up to me to tell me they give. I, I've had someone who wanted me to do something for him came up to me and said to me, I'm the largest giver in this church and I'd like. And, uh, and all of that. And how would I know? I just smile at him. I say, really? Well, that's nice. <laughs> you know, because you don't give to me. You don't even give to the church per se. You bring it to the, You give to God. Your gifts go to him. And from him, you receive your reward. But if people came up to me and said, I give, say thank you. I can't do that. You didn't give that to me. I thought you gave that to Jesus. And if you're expecting a man to say thank you for your generosity, you've made a big mistake. Because only God can give that kind of gratitude to you. And he's only going to say to you what I'm longing to hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what you're going to receive. Does that mean God won't take care of you now? No, God takes care of you now. But we don't give to get. We give because we love. That's how it works. So finally, he says, if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. If my presence is demanded, I will accompany them. As uh, an apostle, he's still a servant. And he wants to make sure that things are done properly and that they are comforted. And we know that in this, by the way, this, this portion here, we know that there was a response of faith because in Romans 15, 25 through 27, Paul writes, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the saints there. Macedonia and Achaia, which was the Greek churches, were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spirit, spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. So he says, they responded. See, I, I, I grew to understand something, and I'll close with this last little thought. It doesn't matter how many times people hear teachings, whether it's on stewardship or whether it's on discipleship or whatever, doesn't matter how many times they hear, they're going to have to make up their mind to do what they hear. First time I ever came to a passage, because you in, in this church know that I, I just teach through, and if it, if it speaks of a subject, we'll look at that subject. The first time I ever spoke on the subject of giving, I thought, oh, great, you know, we'll teach the church to give, and 
And uh, I think the offerings were less that week. Because people respond in faith as God provokes their hearts. I learned that a long time ago. I also learned that people who have a heart to give will give no matter what. They'll find a way to do that. Our church was new. We were meeting at Central School in Ontario. It was storming. And I knew because it was storming so, so much that church was not going to be what it normally is. I knew that bills-wise, we needed to receive X amount of dollars or else we're not going to make our, our rent. I knew that. And when I came in and I stood there on a Sunday morning and I looked out at the congregation that at that time numbered maybe around 200, I had about 70 people in church. And I remember looking out there saying, oh boy, we're not going to make our bills this this week. It's just not going to happen. And so I gave the Bible study. And later on, I had one of my assistants approach me. And they said, our offering was three times what it normally is today. You mean we got $12? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, it was three times what we normally received. And that's when the Lord said, don't you dare worry about this. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. One of the Lord's words that he gave to me when our church was very small and very young was this. I didn't raise this church up to let it fall. I will take care of it. You trust me. And so I know that when you teach passages, some listen, some don't. Some respond in faith, some don't. Those who respond in faith, are blessed. Those who don't, God will teach you. I trust the Lord. He'll take care of it. It's his church. He owns it. But me, I just want to be faithful. It's required in a steward that he be found faithful. I want to be faithful. And I can tell you this, after all these years of walking with the Lord, I can tell you this, I've never outgiven God. I can't. He is always more generous than I am, always. So I trust him. We all ought to, don't you think? We all ought to.